<clears throat> now, can you all hear me? Yep, cool. Yes, good, right. Lots of old faces, new faces out there. I think I know half of you. Um, just by way of background, I've been in ICT for about 23 years, I guess, reasonably infrastructure focused. And in the last four or five years, I've had a particular um, interest in cloud and then how that um, changes the way that we interact with the world. So I guess cloud is a disruptive technology. And a disruptive technology is something that comes along and turns the market upside down. Um, breaks all your business rules and um, you have to adapt to it pretty quickly. Um, on the blogging side, um, I would encourage you all to blog. I think that uh, there's a huge amount of value in sitting down, writing what you think, working your way through those processes, getting your staff to do it as well and just putting it out there. It doesn't mean I'm always right. I definitely have an opinion and I'm probably going to annoy some people today, but that's okay. What I wanted to talk about was um, digital uh, government reform. And what Richard's talking about is uh, an excellent vision. But for agencies, it's very difficult, in my experience, to construct yourself and get yourself into a position where you can actually deliver some of that stuff. It's very really hard. And doing cloud um, by itself and implementing cloud, as um, a lot of you will know, is also difficult. It's a minefield, it's a new technology, there's lots of foibles, there's lots of FUD, and so on and so forth. Um, government, in general, doesn't help by confusing some of the messages. So an example would be that the DIA mandates certain services that you must use. And we don't like to be told what to do. So it already creates a sort of a negative reaction. And then the DIA in the last few weeks and months is starting to move away from that to guiding what you do. And I think that's a much better um, way to do things. So they've released um, a document recently which is, basically says you can consume whatever cloud services you like as long as you answer the 170 questions around security and risk and everything else. But it's a change. It's a change from saying you can't do that, you have to do that, to okay, the horse is bolted, so let's do it safely. Because we know when we survey government that agencies are already, over 75% of you are using cloud services. Every agency I go into is using some kind of cloud service. Most of it's software as a service. Most of it's happening as shadow IT. And what's happening is the business outside of the ICT organisation is effectively signing themselves up to cloud services. And the users are doing the same. They're using Dropbox and everything else. And no matter how many blocks you put on your firewall, they'll continue to do that. So as an ICT organisation, you have to almost adapt to that, make it real, and then figure out how you're going to manage it. So. <coughs> DIA, in my opinion, is starting to move towards a guidance role with a great set of tools. The tools being the IAAS construct, the common capabilities, the other web services, all of that kind of stuff is great. There's another issue inside of government that I see, which is agencies think that an IAAS service or a common capability service will enable them to put all of their ICT services into it. It's sort of the big bang thinking. It won't. At this stage, in my opinion, there's probably about 25% of what you do in terms of common ICT services that can be serviced by a government shared capability. Other capabilities are coming, but you can't just dump everything into one of those services. <clears throat> there's still some risk thinking as well, and the National Cyber Security people released a paper about three or four weeks ago that basically kind of damned cloud when you read it. Massive list of risks and all the reasons why you shouldn't do it. So again, we're sort of getting this left hand, right hand confusing. One of the things um, that I talk to people about with risk is, when it comes to risk, you have to understand what the risk is of where you are today and the service you're gonna consume. Because I'll almost guarantee that when you start to move to some of those cloud services and common services, you'll get a reduction in risk. They'll have better security, 
it'll be um, better monitored, you have the economies of scale, so on and so forth. Um, I think agencies are suffering, or have, have a whole bunch of challenges. One is that um, we haven't invested in ICT, really, in the last six or seven years. There's been this compressing budget on agencies to cut costs 5%, 5%, 5%, 5%. Now, the reality is that when we start to move into some of these services, it may cost more. And that's a challenge that organisations are going to have to try and figure out. One of the um, upsides of cloud is that you get uh, more transparent billing. So when the CEO says to you, why am I spending a quarter of a million dollars a year on this thing? You can say that's because that software is a service, that's what it costs, it costs this much per user. Do you want to do that or do you want us to look at another option? And you're starting to move then also into a broker role. Um, we're doing cloud, but we're not really unlocking some of the benefits yet. So if I look across the agencies, what we know is that there's quite a large proportion now, not quite the majority, that have moved into IAAS, and they're still wrangling with it. Um, and that's going to take some time because if we move workloads, for example, at a technical level, as they stand today, in an unmanaged way, and we haven't rationalised them into a cloud server, so it's going to cost us quite a bit of money. But if we think about rationalising those workloads and what makes sense to go into cloud and evolving that over time, it's a lot better process. <laughs> My bugbear with cloud is that We've, as government, we've become really, really focused on the iron. We've become really focused on the servers and the disk and the network connections and everything else. What I think we need to do is lift our eyes a wee bit. And I think that's what um, I quite like about Richard, is he's looking outwards to the edge. And one of the examples which is quite interesting is Estonia, of all places. Um, I can see some of you nodding. So Sonia sat down and said, I want to create a digital society a few years back. And they just set about doing it. The first thing they did was they got the transport infrastructure right. So they got the telcos right and the broadband and all of that kind of carry on. But basically, where they've ended up is um, they have a population database with a unique ID. 99% of the citizens are inside of that database. Um, they also have an identity card, which allows for digital signing as well. So basically, everyone has a unique ID and a card. And this is pretty cool. Citizens can access all of their own data, regardless of whatever agency or government group owns it or holds it. 400, basically, different pieces of data in a single spot. And this is how you deal with privacy. You can log in with your ID, and you can see which agency, which person has looked at what parts of your file. So it's really transparent. And that's how you kill privacy, by giving citizens the ability to be able to see who's been looking at their stuff. It's simplified, but yeah. And then on the back of that, you can do things like electronic voting. So they call that the digital citizen, and um, they've done really well out of that. And they're a smaller country, about a million people, but there's no reason that New Zealand can't start to look at how they did it, because they've made all of that available. It's all open source the way they planned it, the way they architected it, the way they built it, the issues that they had, the whole thing. So it makes a lot of sense. Just to close, um, some of the lessons in terms of implementing cloud um, and kind of extending your business out into cloud um, providers, the tips that I'd give you would be that um, you need to listen to your provider. So tell your provider what the business outcome is. If it's saving money, tell them it's saving money and how much. If it's enabling mobility to a, um, a certain sector of your work workforce, tell them that's what it is. Don't try and architect it yourself. These guys are the experts. You need to understand um, at an enterprise governance level whether it's the right thing or the wrong thing to do, but lifting back up out of that iron again. Make sure you put a project team in place because projects will always fail unless you have a champion. And it just happens again and again and again. The critical piece of this is service management. <clears throat> and everyone misses it to start with. If you don't have reasonably mature service management, 
when you move to cloud, it will be unmanageable. And that's because your business is already doing software as a service. You're moving to cloud. You'll probably end up with multiple providers. And when something goes wrong, who are they going to call? And how are you going to manage that? What SLAs do you have with your business? How do you present those services back? So service management is as important as cloud itself. Um, and the last one would be create a beachhead. So work with your provider and tell them you just want a small footprint of cloud and then give it to your guys or your outsource providers and say, play with it. I want you to see, uh, I want you to build a file server. I want you to build AD. I want you to move an application in there. I want a sand pit that kind of looks like we do today. And the reason for that is that it will scare out all of the issues, the risks, everything that the particularly operations people do because your levels of access change and all sorts of stuff changes. So giving people a sand pit is a really cheap way of driving some cultural change and thinking and driving the real risks and issues out um, inside your ICT organisations. The last thing is um, evolution, not revolution. Don't think you can do it big bang. Create the beachhead, look at your workloads, understand what makes sense to move to the cloud provider, talk to them about that and do it in a rolling fashion. And most of the agencies that I've talked to who are now in cloud or 75% of the way there, they're just moving a little bit each week, a little bit each week, waiting, making sure it's okay and going again. I've rambled long enough, I think. <laughs> Thanks.